Well, it is very exciting to be back. I can hardly wait to share with you some of the events of the trip. Uh, more detail on Shabbat, and we'll have the people from the trip also share uh, some of the exciting things that happen. And I'll be sharing with you here just a little bit. Uh, but let's start with, how did you guys like Boaz Michael a couple of weeks ago? Did you like that with the Hebrew Gospels? I heard a lot of you have uh, the Hebrew Gospels. It's kind of, you know, exciting to have the, the Gospels in Hebrew. And it had the English with it. And then what did you guys think of Danny Ben-Gigi? Yeah. I knew you guys would like him. We, I've been a, we've been friends for a while. And... Uh, I thought he would be a great follow-up talking about the importance of the Hebrew language after you had the Hebrew Gospels, you know, and then to go and jump right back into that and start looking. Uh, how many of you would like to have him back sometime? <clears throat> yeah, well, he and I and Frank were talking about all three of us doing a seminar together sometime up here, which would be a lot of fun. And so I'm just glad you guys uh, liked both the Hebrew Gospels and Danny Ben Gigi. And what we'll be doing this next year on Monday nights, at least for the next, I don't know, maybe five months, six months, something like that, uh, we'll be going, well, I'll tell you in a little bit. Let's, uh, <laughs> let, let me start with the trip first a little bit, uh, how it went. It was, it was just really exciting. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna pull up uh, let's see one of my notes here. Okay, I've got to tell you how our trip began, uh, some of the exciting things that happened. Well, first off, as you remember, we left Saturday morning, as a matter of fact. We arrived late Sunday afternoon. Now, how many of you have been to Israel before? You know what it's like after you fly halfway around the world. I mean, it was a, it was, it's a cruel flight. It really is. We flew from here to JFK and then JFK to uh, Tel Aviv. And then when we landed in Tel Aviv, we had a two-hour bus ride to Tiberias. And uh, we stayed up on the hill of uh, the northern part of the Galilee. So every, it, we arrived. It was dark. Everyone's just exhausted. And, but when they woke up, all the rooms faced the Sea of Galilee. And the very first thing we did... Uh, the following morning of the whole tour, we went on Danny Carmiel's boat on the Sea of Galilee in worship for about an hour, just sang worship songs. And I think that really set the tone for the trip. And what was really kind of funny is uh, as we were getting off uh, the boat, there was other people from other tour groups getting onto the boat. And uh, there were these group from Nigeria. They all had their Nigerian clothing on. This is flowing clothes with green and all these different dots. And they were just all smiling. And here they are coming onto their boat as we're coming off. I mean, they had like probably 100 people, 100 Nigerians that were coming as we're going off. It was kind of interesting is uh, our group, we ended up, it's a real narrow little bridge as you go down to get onto these tour boats. And uh, our group was on both sides, and the Nigerians were coming down the middle. So we're going this way, and they're coming the other way. And part of our group, uh, one of our group uh, members yelled out, Nigerians for Israel! And they go, yay! We start doing like a hand clap, like at a football team, coming onto the ball field. They're going this way, we're going that way, and they're all yelling out, Nigerians for Israel! And it was a lot of fun. As far as the people that came on our trip, of course, we had to, about half of the group was from local El Shaddai here. But then the other half of the group were people that are part of our worldwide internet congregation. And as many of you know, they feel so alone. They feel like there's, they're out there, you know, all by themselves with no one to talk to. We had uh, three people from South Africa, a family. We had a couple of people from Canada. We had a lady from Germany. Uh, of course, we had people with a family of six from California. We had people from Texas, uh, South Dakota, North Carolina, I think Virginia. I mean, people were just from all over, and uh, we just melded just right away. And uh, we had a wonderful time. Uh, that same day, how many of you ever been on the Sea of Galilee at Ginosar, where they have that boat they discovered that's 2,000 years old? 
They discovered a 2,000 year old boat and they lifted it up out of the Sea of Galilee. Some archaeologists found it and they preserved it. You can see this boat that was at the same time. Well, see, our trips uh, are really different than any other trip. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been, you know, on a tour to Israel before. That wasn't ours, but ours, we are different. And uh, what was really neat is it's because of the connections that we have. Uh, the tour guide that I chose, I had had before, and I had a real good connection with him, and I knew that he knew people besides just so Stefanski knowing people. Well, after we watched, we had everybody see the whole program of this 2,000-year-old boat, we had the archaeologist who found it come and speak to us. Yeah, so he was part of the, the group for that day. And so he was able to speak to everyone. And then we went to Capernaum. Uh, many of you are familiar, that's where Yeshua spent just about his whole life, was up there on the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. Uh, then we had lunch on a kibbutz. And then we went to a city called Katsreen. It's an, uh, an old village, what it would have been like about 2,000 years ago. Uh, and then since we were at the Sea of Galilee anyway, we went to Galilee Experience. Okay, many of you are familiar with that shop. Well, as we were leaving, it just so happened they were doing a laser light show on the Sea of Galilee, and it was just an incredible laser light show. You, it, people were running, it showed like the whole history of Israel, crossing the Red Sea and all this kind of things, which was a lot of fun. And then on Tuesday, the second day, uh, we went up to the Syria-Lebanon border up through Tel Dan, uh, which is just incredible. Those of you that know, have been to Tel Dan know what I'm talking about. It's, it's just a beautiful place with streams and you're walking over rocks in the water and uh, you're going right up to where, if you remember, uh, Jeroboam put a golden calf up in, at Bethel and then up in Dan. And we went up there, and probably the most exciting thing for me is watching the people's eyes that are on these trips as they see things. Uh, many of you are familiar in the book of Genesis, when uh, Abraham took his 318 trained servants and chased after the four kings who had kidnapped Lot and, you know, his family and everyone else. Well, it says in Genesis how they went all the way to Dan. Well, it so happens, another archaeologist found the original gates of Dan of 4,000 years ago, the adobe brick gates that are all uncovered. There's this huge tent covering us, this gigantic massive wall. So here we're looking at the actual stone stair that Abraham in Genesis was walking up, looking through the, at the original gates of Dan. And from there we went to Caesarea Philippi. And many of you may be familiar with that. This is where uh, Yeshua told uh, Peter upon his rock, I'll build my church, you know. And uh, you're actually there looking at this massive rock wall so you can understand what he was talking about. And then from there we did something that I'll bet you hardly no one has ever done on a tour. As a matter of fact, we have an Israeli tour guide who grew up in Israel who's been a tour guide for 25 years. And he said we were going places he had never been. Okay. Well, one of the places that we went, let's go ahead and put up the first PowerPoint. This was our second day. We got to go down to a military base. And this is a military base where it's a tank, artillery. And so here we're entering the gate. We have this guard who's, you know, checking out, making sure we're the group that's supposed to come. We're pulling into the base. We're passing by these military vehicles. Well, it's so uh, interesting is they were all on high alert uh, anyway, but they, they, the soldiers even prepared lunch for us under this tent. And we've got to, when we were done, we've got to go sit down with the soldiers, visit with them, have lunch. Uh, and it was, uh, it, they really took good care of us there. Well, it so happens they were doing maneuvers that day. And so these were like two Syrian tanks that were uh, off in the distance. You can barely see this barrel here, and this one had something on it too. And so we got to literally be on the base watching them do tank maneuvers. So here we are, and all of a sudden we see this big tank come flying over this hill. And the purpose, I mean, it's probably three quarters of a mile or a mile away, these two tanks are just about. And we, we're right next to this tank flying over the hill. It stops and it fires at these two tanks. So here is a picture uh, of the tank coming. Uh, I mean, we were so close to these things. And then it fires. But we got the fire. We even got the flash. Oh, I mean, this is just incredible. We have movies. Some of the people have movies of all of this, watching the tank moving, firing. We got the flash of the tank firing, just boom, you know, and then the smoke afterwards. And then we look at the target, boom, hit the target. It was just a perfect shot, you know, and then it, it shot again. 
And then they have this fog thing where the tank can disappear to the enemy. So after it did that, it releases this fog and it surrounds itself so the enemy can't see the tank. And so we're getting several pictures of that as it's coming back toward us. And uh, then it points the tank right at us and we're kind of smiling. <laughs> Put it down, <laughs> you know, turn it. But uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun uh, being able to go right onto this military base. And uh, Yeshua Stefanski and I are talking about maybe going out to a naval base next year. And we've already talked to him. Maybe I'll go out on the Mediterranean on a naval ship or go on to an Air Force base with Apache helicopters and all of this. But not too many tours get to do that. And so that's why we always recommend people come on our tours and you are going to have a lot of fun. And then what was really cool is when we were done, you can see Lee Armstrong right here who comes to El Shaddai. Uh, he had a, a, a food allergy, which reminds me, if you guys do come on our trips, you got to let us know if you have food allergies. He had a real uh, bad allergic reaction to sesame seeds. And just about everything in Israel has sesame seeds. And uh, here we're going to be baptizing everyone in the Jordan. He really wanted to be baptized. And that morning he ate a sesame seed. The next thing, within an hour, we're rushing him to the emergency room in a hospital. He spends four hours in the hospital while we're all doing the baptizing in the Jordan. And then we have to come back and uh, pick him up. Fortunately for him, even though Israel's hospitals are the best in the world, his emergency stay for four hours is only like 300 bucks. And, uh, but anyway, uh, we really blessed him because we went, we went down to a lot at the Red Sea. That's where we did the mikvah. We mikvahed him in the Red Sea. So his old man was with all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and all the Egyptians. But anyway, I don't know if you guys remember back in July or something like that is when we uh, were doing the Shema in August. But before that, there was a man from South Africa who had sent a radio clip of everyone singing the Shema. Well, his family came on the trip, and this is him right here. And when we were done, this is the general or the main commander of this base. And Dirk suggested that we, he read Psalms 83, which many of you are familiar with. So all the soldiers gathered around, and they were praying and everything, too. He's a religious. You can see he has the kippah. So he wasn't a secular soldier. He's a religious soldier. So then all the soldiers and all of us together uh, read the, the Psalms. And it was just a real good connection that we had with them. We'll stop there for now. We'll, have, we'll tell you more exciting stories on Shabbat. And I'll have, let some of the other people who went testify. But then on Wednesday is when we did the mikvahs in the Jordan at Yard and Neat. And everyone really enjoyed that. Then we went down to Qumran, where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then from there, we went to the uh, Dead Sea. And we spent a couple days at the Dead Sea. Uh, we went to Masada. That was day four. Everyone enjoyed Masada. It was just an incredible time. And then day five, uh, we went off to Elat. So we went from the northern border, looking at Syria and Lebanon, all the way down to the southern border, where you can see Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Jordan. Uh, I mean, we did the whole area. And then some people on Shabbat went to Petra. About nine of the 45 went to Petra. The rest of them just uh, relaxed. And then on uh, the Sunday, we traveled from Elat up to Jerusalem. And then on the eighth day, <clears throat> we went to the Mount of Olives, uh, which is a lot of fun. Those of you that have ever been there, to be on the Mount of Olives, looking at the Eastern Gate and we had an incredible time. We went to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is there. But those of you that have went there, some of you may not have known it, but as you're going down the Mount of Olives, mostly everyone goes to the left side where the Garden of Gethsemane is. Uh, but there's another Garden of Gethsemane just right across this little street that no one ever goes to uh, because there's usually an Arab standing there wanting money before they let you in. Uh, but we went ahead and did that so our group could go on that side and there it's peaceful and quiet and you can walk around and just pray by one of the olive trees while you're looking over at the eastern gate. And everyone really enjoyed that time. We went up to the King's David tomb where some people also believe that's where the upper room is. Uh, and then from there, everyone had the most wonderful time at Moshe Kempinski's bookstore, Shorashim. Uh, those of you that don't know him, he's an incredible man. As a matter of fact, I brought back 24 of his books uh, that we'll have available probably next Monday night. And then from there, we went to the Western Wall. Day nine from Jerusalem, uh, we drove up to Itamar, where uh, Rabbi Moshe and Leah Goldsmith are. 
and we went right next, I mean, we were right at the front door of the Fogel family who were murdered this last year. Uh, from there, we looked at Awarta, which was close by. We saw just how close the Arab village was to their uh, Itamar. But we went down that hill and we planted about 24 trees. You know, he had bought a bunch of trees and it's so exciting to see everyone from our group all jumping in, you know, putting the trees in and covering them with soil, uh, really leaving part of themselves there. And uh, the rest of the trip was just uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, we were just going all over. Uh, so it was just really exciting. We had just a lot of fun in Jerusalem. You know, we went to Hebron, of course, uh, and saw David Wilder. Most people don't go to Hebron. And uh, I mean, that's where Ruth's tomb is, Jesse's tomb. Of course, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried there. And uh, people just couldn't believe it because the, how many of you believe our media is biased? <laughs> well, I tell you what, when you go to Hebron, you see just how biased it is. And uh, David Wilder is just a wonderful man uh, to have him lead that part of the tour. So also we drove by Shiloh. We wanted to spend more time in Shiloh, but the way the trip was going, we just, it was just so overwhelming. There was just so much going on. We were just on the run the whole time. So I just want to share <clears throat> briefly with you a little bit about the Israel trip, but we'll share some more on Shabbat and have everyone kind of share their highlights. But uh, it went fantastic. It really did. And we're looking forward to next year in Jerusalem. So, but it looks like a lot of you have been to Israel. How many of you that have been to Israel would like to go back sometime? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I see two hands on some people, yes. Well, I tell you what, it's, it really gets into you. Once you go there, I always say it's like a Lay's potato chips. Once isn't enough. Once you have one, you got to go back. Okay, well, what I want to do now is share with you a little bit about the Hebrew language. And this is kind of like what we'll be doing on Monday nights. On Monday nights for the next several months, uh, I know you guys enjoyed having the gospel in Hebrew and then having Danny Ben-Gigi talk about how important the Hebrew language is. So I want to go into that more and more depth. So those, how many of you don't know anything about the Hebrew language? I mean, most people here know quite a bit. Some of you, this is very okay. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to satisfy both the beginner as well as the one who really knows it, because we're going to really go in depth into each individual letter. I mean, if, how, could any of you talk a whole hour on the letter Q? Or, or the letter A? I mean, there's not much you can say about the letter A. But I can talk an hour just on the letter Aleph. I can talk an hour just on the letter Bait. Every single letter is a number. It's a picture. Uh, there's so much depth of meaning to each letter. So what I thought I'd do is spend the next several months just speaking, uh, taking time speaking about each letter. So those of you that are new, it'll, by the time we're done, you'll know every Hebrew letter. But, but those who already know the Hebrew alphabet, you're going to have an understanding like you've never had before. Uh, so let's go ahead and go to the PowerPoint and let's just test everybody real quick here. Well, I guess it's on it. But what's this letter? Aleph. And then what do we have next? And. Oh, I, okay. We'll test you people. See, what they do is they, with each letter on this, they have a word that begins with that letter. Can anyone tell me what this is? Uh-huh, yeah, it means like to, to wave a flag, like a banner. And then what? Hey. Oh, did, can anyone read this? Havdalah. Okay, after Shabbat. Here's the Vav. And what's that? And the next letter is the K. Oh, what's this word? Yeah, the picture kind of gives it away, guys. And then we have the tet. And, and what is this word? Yes, talit. The yud. And that's what that is, a yod. Okay, then we have the kaf. This is the Hebrew word for dog. What is it? Remember Joshua and Caleb. Caleb. Yeah, that's what his name meant. 
You have the, the Lamed. Do you guys remember what this word is? Yeah, the Lulav. Then we have the Mem. You guys know what this word is? The Mezusa. Then the Noon. And the next letter is the Samek. You guys, can you read this word? That's right, Suka. The Ayan. And then you have the, what, the pay, the Tzadi, that's your Tzedaka box, the Kuf, the Resh, and the Shin. What's this word? Shofar. And then finally the Tav. And what's this word? Torah. So we're going to go through that, but let me... Uh, as part of our lesson today, let me kind of give you an intro. Oh, that reminds me, before I do that, can your camera get real close? Go ahead and switch off the PowerPoints. Uh, I want people to see this real close. Let me read it first. After we left the tank battalion, well, first off, what we did, we donated uh, funds through Israel Support Fund to that military base. Uh, as a matter of fact, today, is Monday, which is yesterday in Israel. But uh, what they did, we delivered uh, all the fleece they had to the soldiers. They really wanted fleece jackets, hats, different things that they needed for the military base. And so you hear at El Shaddai, uh, through your donations and everything, help us donate to Israel Support Fund to help the military bases. I'm going to hold it up so you can see it. And what it says is, Dear Pastor Mark Biltz and El Shaddai, uh, we the soldiers of the Sufa Battalion wish to salute you. We want to express our huge appreciation for your wonderful and generous donation. This will greatly help us and many other soldiers and make our activity for far more pleasant. A blessing onto you and on your congregation for all your help and blessing to our Battalion 53 Sufa. On behalf of the soldiers and the commander of the Sufa family, again, thank you and God bless. Shalom. And it's got this picture of this tank. Isn't that cool? So anyway, I thought that was pretty cool that they would do that for us. Okay, now back to the Hebrew language. This will be more or less an intro. And I may kind of uh, go over it again a little bit next week for those that aren't here. Because I know we'll have more people here next week when they hear what we'll be talking about. Let me ask you something. What is more important? The external wrapping of a package or its contents? I'll never forget when my kids were little. We uh, wanted to do something fun. I don't know what they were, first grade, second grade, or something like that. So my wife and I... Uh, thought it'd be fun. We, uh, her dad had this little cabin out in the lake. And so we spent the weekend out in the lake. And I thought, I know, let's do a treasure hunt. <clears throat> and so I dug a couple of little holes in two different places about 20 feet apart. And uh, I uh, got like a little bag and I put some stuff in it and hid it in the ground. And then we covered it up. And so my wife took one of the kids. I took the other kid. And we said we had found this treasure map and so take four steps to the left and five steps to the right so we had them doing all this loop-de-loop -loop walking around and finally we ended up at the hole and we start digging you know and they're digging and they they're all excited about seeing this buried treasure is there anything there you know and so they open it up and we got this box in there and they open the box and inside we had a little bit of treasure and some play money and my one son goes play money who wants play money you know he wanted the real thing and uh so anyway, we end up giving him some money. But uh, the, the most important thing is not the package, is it? It's what's inside the package. Uh, how, how many of you ever bought a car that was a lemon? The car looked great on the outside. Boy, this is a fantastic car, but you get it home and all of a sudden you hate this car. Nothing but problems. Uh, also, uh, how about the features of people? Sometimes we find people may look beautiful on the outside, but they're full of selfishness and hate and everything else on the inside, right? But all too often, and you can prejudge people, even the Jewish people. I mean, some of them, they're walking around with this box on their head and their you know, the funny clothing and everything else. And, and we can prejudge people without ever taking the time to talk to them to see what they're really all about, what's inside. 
Well, here's a thought. A person's mission in life directs their choices of where they go and what they do. Did you catch that? Think about this. If your mission and your goal was to be an Olympic swimmer, are you going to be eating all kinds of junk food, sitting in front of a TV, or are you going to be getting up early in the morning and swimming every single day? Okay? So whatever your choices are, whatever your mission in life is, your mission in life is going to direct the choices of where you go and what you do. So think about that in the terms of our relationship with God and our walk with God. If, if, if I told you I really wanted to do something, but I, everything in my life was doing the opposite, you, were, you would question what my mission really is. And so what we have to realize is how important our mission is. As a matter of fact, that reminds me of something else I wanted to share about. And it was a dream that I had while I was in Israel. It, it was very unique. Uh, to sum it up, basically what it was, was I was doing what I was doing in Israel, guiding, you know. And it was a matter of trying to get the people to get ready to get on the bus to go to a particular site or whatever it is. And uh, how many of you, when you had kids, I know this happened with me when my kids were little, you wanted to do something, but because of their behavior, they could, you couldn't do it. You wanted to take them someplace on a trip or do something, but they were just misbehaving and it just wasn't going to work. You're still your kids, you still love them, but the way they behave, it's just not going to go work. Well, when you think about this, going back to this whole concept of a person's mission in life, how it directs their choices, can you imagine when you think of all these professional football players, baseball players, or people that are going to be in the Olympics, they get to the peak of their mission and then they blow it. They go do something stupid. Like they get involved with drugs, you know, or some affair or something like that. And it's like, what are you doing? You work so hard. You work your whole life to get to this point and you're there and then you just blow it. What is wrong? I mean, doesn't that sound, uh, but doesn't it happen? And I really felt like the Lord was telling me, uh, well, in the dream, basically, that we are in the last lap this is it. We were, God wanted us in this generation to fulfill a mission for him. And we're so close. We are so close. And how many of us, this is our goal, this is our mission, but there is some sin in our life where we blow it and we're disqualified. Not that we're not going to heaven, but it's like, how many of you would like to be, you've, your goal was to be in the World Series, and let's say you've been in a baseball team for five years, your team's never won the World Series, finally the time has come, you're gonna be in the World Series, and you're so excited because you're on the team that's in it, and you go to play, and then they find out you're, you've done something stupid and you're disqualified. You're still on the team, but you can't play. I mean, can you imagine? Well, I tell you what, don't allow that to happen to you guys. Don't allow that to happen. Don't allow some stupid thing in your life to disqualify you at the very moment of history that we were created to be here and we have a mission to accomplish. So anyway, I want you to realize that when God created the universe, he built internally the mission within every part of his creation. Okay, every, every part of creation, God internally put what its mission is. What do I mean by that? The animals that hibernate, they know how to crack nuts and store food, don't they? They just know that. Mountains, they carry forests on their backs, right? That's just what they were made to do, and they do it. Well, God created everything to fulfill its mission, giving the, it the ability to carry out its role, okay? Now, how... Wouldn't it be kind of stupid for God to create something and give it a big mission and then he doesn't give it the ability to do it? That wouldn't make sense, would it? So every, every part of creation, the squirrels, the whales, I mean, how do these whales and birds know how to migrate? You know, when to migrate? You know, how to find their way back in the middle of the ocean or in the middle of the air? You know, God created every single bit of its creation, the ability to know what its mission is and gave it the ability to carry out its role. Well, it's the same thing with human beings. 
Now let me say this, God breathed life into a human body, right? Now, what does our body become when our soul leaves? Okay, it's just material. All right, flesh. Now I want you to think of this. What would happen to the entire universe if God ceased to keep it going? If God ceased to keep the, the universe going, what would happen? That'd be it. Well, let me ask you this. How was the universe created? Through words, okay? Or God's instruction, right? God gave instruction and the world responded. His Torah, so God's Torah, which means instruction, is how the world was created. Well, it's interesting, the sages say this. They say that the entire universe was created so mankind could live out the Torah. Think about that. God's priority, the epitome of his creation was human beings to be able to obey him and have a relationship with him. So that meant all the rest of the entire universe, the stars, the planets, this earth, everything on it, the rocks, the mountains, the hills, everything was created so we could fulfill our mission. How could we fulfill our mission if we were put on a planet where we could not breathe? Okay, so God literally created the entire universe so his Torah could be fulfilled. Therefore, think about this, let's think about the consequence. But first off, does everyone agree that that would make sense? Therefore, if it ever came to a point where there was not even one person studying the Torah, the universe would cease to exist because its mission would have no more purpose. That's a pretty incredible thought. The universe came into being so God's will would be fulfilled. God's will want needed to be fulfilled. He, had a, he wanted to have human beings, and so he created a universe, and then he created us. He wanted children to honor parents, so for children to honor parents, he had to create families. He wanted people who would want his intervention and need his goodness and would give him thanks, so he had to create us so we could not survive without food. Therefore, we need food. Therefore, we call upon him to provide us the food. So you can see how all of this is unfolding, right? So we exist to carry out God's will. Remember in Revelations, it says we were created for his pleasure. We, were, we, were, we exist to carry out God's will as instructed in his Torah. The universe exists to allow us to accomplish this. So a world incapable of serving God's design would have no reason to exist. As a matter of fact, listen to Psalms 119. This is verse 89 through 91. And what's interesting, if I don't know how many of you knew this, but Psalms 119 is divided up into the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Okay? There's eight verses for the letter Aleph, then there's eight verses for the letter Beit, eight verses for the letter Gimel, where every single Hebrew word begins with a word that begins with that letter. So actually Psalms 119 is praising the Hebrew alphabet. That's what it's all about. And it so happens, verse 89 begins with the letter Lamed. And do you remember what the Lamed means and refers to? Teaching or instruction, authority. And here's how Psalms 119, 89 begins. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in the heavens. Your faithfulness to all generations. You have founded the earth. Here it is. You have founded the earth and it remains. They stand to this day according to your ordinances for all are your servants. In other words, not just human beings are your servant. But the mountains are your servant, the squirrels are your servants, the rocks are your servant. And basically it's saying everything is standing this day according to your ordinances. The sages say that the reason we still exist is because, in, uh, for example, in Genesis 1-3, it says this, And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 6, God said, let there be a firmament, and there was a firmament. 
Verse 11, God said, let the earth bring forth grass. Well, what prevents the heavens from aging, decaying, and crumbling? How many of you are familiar with the term entropy? Everything just goes downhill, right? Well, what prevents the heavens from aging, decaying, and crumbling? Why do some seem eternal while other things seem to last for only a brief season? Why is it some things just, they last for a short time and are gone, but then other things that we see in the universe seem to just go on and on and on? Well, the heavens continue to exist because not an instant goes by when God does not cease from saying, let there be light. In other words, the reason why there's still light is because it wasn't a one-time thing. Every day, God is speaking to this world to continue to exist. Listen to Psalms 102, verse 25 through 28. This is kind of interesting. It says, of old have you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. But then it says, they shall perish, but you shall endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shall you change them, and they shall be changed. But you are the same, your years shall have no end. The children of your servants will continue, and their seed will be established before you. Just as the word of God gave being to the entire universe, so it is his word that continues to give being to everything. You following me? It is continually speaking to the universe that allows things to continue. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this next week or the week after, but I think it's interesting where it talks about the heavens will perish here. And you're going to understand that more in, a, in next week or the week after because Yeshua, when he talks about heaven and earth will pass away, right? But what he says is going to stand forever. You're going to see a deeper meaning to that here shortly. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, it says this, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So Yeshua is the word of God, right? And so we have to make a distinction between the written word and the living word. Now, how many of you know, many of you may question this, but I really believe this is true, and if you don't believe it, that's fine. But how many of you know, and I believe God spoke Hebrew when he spoke creation into being. Believe me, he did not say, let there be light. That's in our Bible, but he didn't speak English. When God told Moses to write how it happened, he did not use English. The Bible says that God said, yehi or, or let there be light. So God using the letters of the Hebrew alphabet to form words when he spoke them, creating the universe. So this is, uh, this is why I'm setting the stage for the Hebrew language, going over every letter and how phenomenal it is. When you realize to form words, you have to have letters. God spoke, let there be light. But he didn't say, let there be light. He said, yeah, he or, okay? Every letter is phenomenal. So God, using the letters of the Hebrew alphabet to form words, it was those words. He spoke Hebrew when he spoke, creating the universe, translating his will into reality. So the Hebrew letters then are the raw material of all that was and is created. Are you following me? Think about this. If God spoke everything into being, and he used words which are made up of letters, those words are basically the raw material of all of creation. So in every Torah scroll, do you realize if even one letter is missing, it becomes invalidated? Throughout the scriptures, there is praise for the letters. Uh, those of you that took the Hebrew class this last year saw, just like in Psalms 119, 
Well, also the virtuous woman, you'll see, it's an acrostic of the Hebrew alphabet. <clears throat> so throughout the scriptures, there's praise for the letters of the Hebrew alphabet as an alphabetical sequence is used to praise God. And so what we're going to do over this next several months, we're going to look at the letter, the numerical value, the picture, and I'm going to show you some incredible things. Plus, we're going to go through the Psalms. I don't know how many of you enjoy the Psalms. But we're going to look at the Psalms from a Hebraic perspective over this next year. And then we also may go through more of the New Testament books as well. So we've got some exciting things planned for you. But one of the other things that I also wanted to do, and uh, several people have asked it over the last year, because the year before we did it, and then this last year we didn't do it as much. So this year we're going to do it again. Is have a question and answer time. Because there are a lot of people that may be new to El Shaddai or some that have been going here for a while and they may want to know uh, an answer to either a question of what El Shaddai believes or maybe they just have a verse that they were wondering about. And I'm not saying I'm going to have all the answers uh, on the spur of the moment. Uh, many of them I will. Some of them I'll have to say I'll get back to you. But the other thing too I want to let you guys know, if you have questions that you want me to address the next week, write them on a note and give them to Nancy or Tina or me or whatever. Uh, and then maybe the next week we'll answer them. And that will be the same thing for the people on the internet too. I want to open this up all over the world. Uh, if people on the internet, uh, if there's a question that you want me to try to address during this question and answer session, uh, email us at El Shaddai Ministries, uh, the question, and we'll try to answer it. Not that we're going to have time to answer every question. When I mean, We had two million hits last month on our website. But anyway, so for tonight, does anyone have any burning question? Uh-oh, we got some questions. Okay, now I need a volunteer to pass the mic around. And this looks hot. I don't mean hot, but hot. So go ahead. What is your question? Okay, so my question is that we had uh, Boaz Michael here, and he's got the Hebrew Gospels. But it's my understanding only Matthew was in Hebrew and all the others were in Greek. That is a misunderstanding. As a matter of fact, we have a book that I highly recommend. It's a red book called Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus. And it goes in and it'll explain to you how that is not true. So I highly recommend you get that book, Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus. And you can see that a lot of it, uh, a lot more than you think was in Hebrew. Over there to the end. Um, concerning the Paleo versus the um, Proto-Canaanite. It's about the same thing. It is, yeah. I grant it. But why do the, what is your reason as best you can that the rabbinics kind of poo-poo the Paleo, so to speak? as opposed to the modern biblical. Well, I don't, I don't think they poo-poo it. I think a lot of them aren't familiar with it. And then it's, I think it's just a matter of people aren't aware. Uh, there are rabbis who are aware. When I show it to them, they love it and want to know more. But I think it's just a matter of you don't know what you don't know. Uh, but there's some incredible things you're going to see, not only in what I'm going to show you this next year, is not only incredible things from the Paleo-Hebrew or Proto-Canaanite, but also from the modern Hebrew letters, the way they're designed as well. But I, I don't think they poo-poo it. I think they just, it's, you know, 2,400 years old. They're just not familiar with it. But once they do, they jump right into it. Oh, that reminds me while you're doing that. My hat. You're wondering, I hardly never wear hats. What am I doing with this hat tonight? And the camera pe keep, people keep saying, lift your hat up so we can see your face. But what this is, this, they gave everyone in our group a hat. And it's the Storm Battalion. And so at the top it says Storm Battalion. And underneath what it says is to be number one, you have to put forth the effort. Yeah. Oh, that was cool. So... A little earlier, you said um, the, that God continues to speak the existence, uh, continues to speak that there be light or whatever. Do you have a scripture reference that says that to us? Well, basically, uh, Colossians 1, 16 and 17 that I read from the New Testament, it says, by him, all things are held together. He's continually holding everything together. If, if God uh, just separated himself from creation, that wouldn't exist. Yeah. And if... Uh, it is... Uh, is the way you interpret that. 
Yeah, that would be, yeah, that's that. But I believe there's other things too throughout the Torah, and I'll try to find some verses for you that God, uh, he does. You're gonna see this when we study uh, the plagues in the uh, Exodus, how God, uh, so many people think they're the God of this world, they don't necessarily think of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he's detached from the world. He doesn't care about the world. He put everything in motion and he walked his way and turned his back on it and just left us. But God is very personally involved with this world, okay? And he continues to keep things uh, going in motion. And uh, if, if he ever became detached from this world, you know, and yeah. I think he's continually telling the earth to bring forth fruit. Be and the reason why I say that is because it was how man behaved that determined if Israel got rain or not. Our behavior, see this is the thing, even today, uh, it's mostly in Israel, but I believe it applies to us around the rest of the world. God said to Israel, if you disobeyed, I'm gonna tell the rain, you don't rain anymore. And if you do behave, I will tell the rain, you continue to rain. So God is always speaking to the world or not speaking or telling it what to do depending on our behavior. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Okay, I got a question. In your uh, travel log when you went up to the border and you saw in the distance, you said Syrian tanks. Were there Syrians in there? Because they could, no. Like, look well, like actually, they fired you can't. When you go to Syria, uh, you can see the tank lines. But I, w I think you may have misunderstood what I was saying when I was showing when we went to the northern part of the Galilee and they were practicing with their tanks. We saw them. They had two dummy tanks sitting off in the background as if they were Syrian tanks practicing. Right. Thank you. It sounded yeah. Like you were but yes. As a matter of fact, last year when I was up at Tel Dan, we heard, we were literally hearing Hezbollah do firing, doing their military testing. That's how close we were to the border. Yeah, hold it close. Ben-Gigi. Okay, Danny okay. Ben-Gigi. Yeah, I took his class 20 some years ago, and he taught that God sang the Hebrew and he had musical notes for all of them, as well as the colors and that. Are you gonna have that as well? Uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm very familiar with what you're talking about. It is incredible. And I bet God has a great voice. Do they still teach, do they have classes for ancient Hebrew? Or sure. is that just? No, sure they do. Of course, yes. Okay, up front, here's uh, someone up front. Was uh, reading um, one of the First Fruits uh, lessons about the agreement that Abimelech made with Abraham um, that they were not going to um, have hostilities towards one another. And we've been, or I've, I've led, been led to believe that the Philistines were eventually tied in with the Palestinians. And part of that agreement uh, was that or, or the first fruits was saying that the land of the Philistines was outside of the land of Canaan that God promised Abraham. If that is the case, then should there be a place somewhere, obviously outside the land of Canaan that God promised the Israelites for the Palestinians? Okay, great question. Uh, there's some misunderstandings there too, and I'll clarify some things. First off, that what they did, the Palest there never was any such thing as a Palestinian. The Philistines weren't in the Gaza Strip. The Philistines were off on a little island separate, and they took the term Philistine and created the word Palestine or Palestinian. So it, it's a derivative of the word Philistines, but they were not genealogical descendants of the Philistines. It was a title. Now, as far as the Gaza Strip, right now where they are, you can see in the Torah, that area was definitely given to the tribe of Judah. So let me tell you exactly what happened. Uh, believe it or not, my wife, her sister married a Palestinian Arab who lives in Jerusalem. And what happened was this. I'm even familiar with the 1967 war in Israel. Half of Jerusalem was held by the Jordanians, right? The Gaza Strip was held by the Egyptians at this time. 
So everyone that was in East Jerusalem had Jordanian passports. Everyone in the Gaza Strip had Egyptian passports. Matter of fact, all the Arabs that lived in Israel had Lebanese passports, Syrian passports, because there was no Palestinian state. Well, what happened after the war, and this is coming right from a Palestinian Arab believer, as a matter of fact, uh, I probably gotta be careful what I say on the internet, but he co-pastors a congregation with a Jewish rabbi trying to reach Muslims. So uh, anyway, what he said was that his family after the 67 war, when Jordan pulled out and, and uh, Israel took over all of, all of Jerusalem, all the Jordanians told the Jordanians in Israel, you're no longer Jordanians, we're revoking your passports, you can't leave. All the Egyptians told the Egyptians in Gaza Strip, we're revoking your passport, you're no longer Egyptians, you can't leave. Every Arab country revoked all the passports of their citizens, and so they couldn't go anywhere. They, were, they literally were stuck. It, it, it was a bad situation. All the Jews were allowed to immigrate to Israel in, but none of the Arabs were allowed to immigrate out to their home country. And so the Arabs created this whole problem wanting to leave them there just to create this crisis. But there are no Palestinians. There are former Egyptians and Jordanians and Lebanese and Syrians who have their passports revoked. Now there are people, there are Arabs who lived in Israel for let's say 500 years for generations and generations, they were Arabs. You know, it's just sad what happened. I am very much pro the Palestinian people. It's their government I can't stand. There's nothing wrong with the people. We love the people. Uh, we hate uh, to see them teaching how to make bombs to kindergartners but, uh, and the terrorism, but I'm not necessarily anti the Arab people or anything like that. But they created the problem. Yeah, Lisa? Wait for the mic so they can get this on tape. But that's what he said. He said one day he woke up, he was, his family, they were no longer Jordanians, and they couldn't, they couldn't do anything. I was just going to add that, um, and when the Britain held Israel, or Palestine, um, all the Jews and the Arabs that lived there had British passports that said Palestine on it. Right. And they were all considered themselves, if you want to say, Palestinian. Right. The kind Jews like, were the Palestinians. Yeah, it's kind of like I, we're Washingtonians. Right. And, right. and they had the Palestine Orchestra, which was all Jews. So. Right. The Palestine Orchestra was all Jews. As a matter of fact, I've seen Palestinian passports for the Jewish people uh, back in the 40s. The Jews were the Palestinians and anyone of the Arabs that lived there. Yes. Pastor Mark, I'd like to know what it says on your shirt. Great. This says Sababa. And Sababa means awesome, fantastic, terrific. And as you know, uh, Mitsuyan is excellent, but Sababa is beyond excellent. <laughs> Sababa is just phenomenal, fantastic. And uh, so that's what Sababa means. <laughs> that's what El Shaddai is, all you guys. We had a wonderful time. So, so what you're saying is that we have the only Sababa in this country. <laughs> I tell you what, that is, I have another shirt. Uh, I'll have to wear some maybe next Monday night of someone, well, you just have to see it. But it says life is Sababa, or it's, but it's a picture of an animal in a lounge chair by the Dead Sea relaxing. It's really cute. <laughs> Cartoon character. This isn't the same thing true uh, in regards to the 48 war? As soon as Israel became a state, all the Arab countries united and attacked Israel as a state. And they, uh, they allowed some of those Palestinian Arabs to migrate back to their countries, but they never gave them passports. And they were putting them in concentration camps in, in Jordan in Libya, uh, Lebanon, excuse me, and in Egypt and so forth. And those, those concentration camps still exist to this day. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about so that. So it's the same thing over again in, from the 67 till in the 48. They did the same thing again over and over again. They won't recognize Israel. And, and uh, they're claiming them to be Palestinians. Right. Which, you know, the Pal Palestines or Palestinians were what, sea people? Yes. 
Yes. Any other questions over here on the far side, over there? What's the difference between um, ancient Hebrew and the Hebrew they use today, and why sure. Great is question. there a difference? Great question. The, in the, the ancient Hebrew, every letter was a picture. For example, uh, the letter Aleph I put up first. In the ancient Hebrew, it was an ox. It looked like an ox. Uh, the letter Beit in Hebrew means house. Uh, I don't know if you know what the modern bait looks like, but in Moses' day, it was a three-room house for the letter. And David's day, it was a tent on a landscape. Okay, so the, the picture language evolved. Uh, so it looks different than modern Hebrew. Uh, the modern Hebrew still looks like a house, the letter bait, as far as it has a roof, a wall, and a floor with an open at the beginning. So that's the difference. Every, every letter used to be a picture it's also a word. So every letter is a word. So if you have a four letter word, you have four words within the one word. But every letter was a picture. Right up here again. Okay, not more than two questions allowed at one time. The other was a comment. This is a question. Okay. <laughs> so I was reading recently because I was taking an online Hebrew course that what we see is the Dalit now, but the Paleo Hebrew, it was called the Dig. And it resembled the fish, and then later at the, I mean, the proto-Canaanite, and then when it became the paleo, it became the door. Well, the, the Dalet had about four different pictorial shapes. It evolved. And I think that's probably why uh, D-A-G is fish right, in Hebrew, right. like Dagon, Dagon, the Dagon said, yeah. god. Okay. Yeah, things evolved. Any other questions? Boy, this was easy. I just, I just want to go back to the question of the Palestinians. And um, if, if we don't understand that whole issue of who the Palestinians really are, when you begin to understand who they really are, you begin to see this massive lie being spread to the whole world. And that's really important. So if you don't understand what happened, Learn that. Because prior to 1948, all the Jews in the land were called Palestinians. But nobody tells you that. So you got to understand that. I really, really, really mean that. Yes. I just want to say how much I appreciate the speakers that you bring in to El Shaddai. They're, they're just, they're incredible. Every single one of them. I just learned so much for I just want you to know that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think the reason why is because all of us need to realize we're learners, we're students, we're Talmudim. I don't think any of us has all the answers. I don't think I have all the answers. El Shaddai has all the answers. And we bring people in. We may not agree totally with everything that they say, but that's part of learning is knowing how to sort knowing how to, okay, like we'll have people who are Jewish, they don't believe Yeshua is the Messiah, and people may question, how can you bring someone in that doesn't believe Yeshua is the Messiah? Well, they have a lot of other things that are excellent that we can learn from, and we need to know how to sort, and when they leave, I can straighten it out, whatever they said, you know. So, but I, I want you guys to realize that learning is so much fun. Learning, getting close to God is so much fun. That reminds me of another thought that I had which kind of ties into what I was saying earlier. But how can you know someone intimately, like we want to know God, if you only spend one hour a week listening to someone talk about that person? Could you know your spouse? If the only time that you had with your spouse was an hour a week of someone describing that person to you? And yet people think they have a relationship with God and they only give it uh, by coming to the services once a week. And so that's what I like about you guys. You guys are, and I, I mean this in a nice way, you're dinosaurs. I mean, you're meat eaters. You don't want the milk and the cookies. You know what I'm saying? You guys want to learn. You want a close relationship with God. And so it's, I mean, I, I so appreciate you guys coming on Shabbat and on Monday nights. Uh, but there has to be more than that in your life if you want to really get to know God. You have to, it ha, it's your walk. It's got to be every fiber of your being is got to be, I want to know you, God. I want to walk with you. Like I said, we're living uh, at the time, uh, the apex of human history. And for heaven's sake, don't, don't allow yourself to be 
just not in the game. Uh, and I don't mean that flippantly when I say it's a game. I know it's not a game, but I'm just saying that uh, this is life. And we, are, we, are the, we were chosen to be alive at this time in history. Like I said before, I used to think, you know, when we all sat down to dinner with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I would want to ask them, oh, tell me what it was like in your day. No, they're going to want to talk to us about you. It says the angels and everyone's looking into this time of history, the grace that was going to be given to us. And they're going to want to sit down and talk to us about what was it like. You were the, you were the culmination of history. You were what all of history was all about is your generation. I don't want to say I hid behind a rock. And so I don't want to watch the game. Uh, put me in, coach. Don't take me out. This is, this is an exciting time that we live in. But the thing is this. It's only going to be exciting if you have a real close relationship with God. And so that's what I want to work on. I don't want to just work on our head. I want to work on our hearts. You know, uh, our hearts think. But a lot of people think a lot of the thinking is done here. No, it says, as a man thinketh where? The heart is an amazing thing. It does a lot more thinking than we know. We think all the thinking's done up here, but no, most of the thinking is done in our heart. And that, to me, that's what I want to do here at El Shaddai, is touch people's hearts, because just having a head knowledge of God isn't going to make it. Just uh, coming to services on the weekend, you're not going to make it. Uh, what I want to do is inspire people on the weekends to live it out the rest of the week and see what a wonderful creator we have. And I, I've got to draw close. I mean, it's like living water, you know. All right. Well, let's stand. We'll wrap it up a little bit early tonight because right now it is six in the morning for me. <laughs> and so uh, pray that I stay awake driving home. At least that's what Sue Belleville asked because she's riding with me. Yeah, let's, let's just pray. And I'm telling you, the, the next several months on Monday night is going to be one of the most exciting adventures as you look at the Hebrew language from another perspective. Abba, Father, Avinu, Malkenu, our Father, our King. Even in Zephaniah, you say that we're all going to go back like a reversal of the Tower of Babel, and we're all going to speak one pure language, which is Hebrew. So, Father, even you told us, that we're all going to be speaking Hebrew again. So we're just getting uh, an advanced learning. We're looking forward to the free download. But Father, we just pray right now that you would just speak to each one of our hearts. Father, that we could draw nearer to you. That we would get to know you more intimately. That each, each and every person here tonight would have a safe trip home. And Father, this next week, they would just jump into your word to get to know you more. We just ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries dot U.S. Be blessed and shalom.